Welcome to the Ben and Lauren Show. It is episode 57, I think. think. It has been a full month or more since we have done a Ben and Lauren Show. And no excuses, we just didn't do them. I'm not sure we had an idea of what to say. It's been a very... um it's been a very strange, strange time. Yeah, there's been a couple nights where we thought we should do a Ben and Lauren show, and I'll say, well, I'm too mad, <laughs> or I'll say, I'm too tired, or... Well, I think there was only one night you said, if I got on there, I would just rant right now. <laughs> it was the night that our governor extended uh, her lockdown and announced that two people could not travel in a car together, and no household was to interact with any other household on pain of a thousand dollar fine and possibly 90 days in jail or something like that so yeah we were pretty mad that was the that was the night ben said i'm not doing a podcast tonight. so a lot has happened since our last uh, ben and lauren show i don't even remember what we talked about in the last one it was right before passover yeah and we uh, it was our first week of quarantine okay And I went to the grocery store and kind of described what I saw. So we are in, what, week seven, week eight? There's weeks now? (laughs) It's measured by weeks. So the whole thing thing started March 13th. A month from that was April 13th. And now we're approaching... This is May 10th. We're approaching... We had to have done one after that. We're approaching May 10th, 13th. We We did one the beginning of April. Okay. So right, right before Passover started. Yep. And Passover ended on April 15th because that's when we went to the big protest rally in Lansing. The very first of the big protest rallies, we did go to it. So we never would have expected this quote-unquote quarantine to be continuing into May. Literally, what, three months later? Well, for one thing, our legislature voted it down, voted to end it several weeks ago. And our governor has taken the bit in her teeth and is... Running with it. She is completely without check or balance at this point. There is no check from the court. There's no check from the legislature. She is doing whatever she wants to do. So since our last Ben and Lauren show, we've had the pleasure of going down to Lansing, packed up the kiddos, and the first... uh, And a lot of food. And a lot of food. (laughs) And an extra toilet. And And our camp toilet. (laughs) Nothing's open. We can't go in anywhere. I can't get food from anyone. So we participated in gridlock. Uh, down in Lansing. That was April 15th. And that was quite an experience, both for for us and for our children. Well, a little bit of backstory to that. Uh, The week of Passover, so it would have been quite a bit into the quarantine, but it was when the first real lockdown orders happened. And my family came to the conclusion that they actually were going to sort of obey the lockdown and we were no longer welcome to come over. Um, because my dad visits with my grandfather every night. And my grandfather, we lost my grandmother three years ago. So my family lives a block away. And my dad, every night, like clockwork, he comes home from the office, he eats dinner, he goes and visits with Papa. And he's my Papa's most regular contact. And there was some pressure within the family that either my dad needed to stop seeing anyone outside so my dad needed to be in strict quarantine or he needed to stop seeing Papa and it was felt that for Papa's sake that was not going to be good for him to lose all contact and so my dad put my family on very very strict quarantine both for my brother Jonathan's sake and for Papa's sake so that that week of Passover we could no longer see anybody. Even if we had, if, if someone had reported us for going next door, we had contact with another household, you're facing now, a $900 fine. We were fully willing to go. We were fully willing to pack up our kids and go to to the Sunday dinner. To my family's to house. To your family's well, we'd, house. We'd, but we hadn't gone anywhere for weeks. I mean, what are we going to be exposing them to either? <laughs> so that week, Ben and I both experienced a great Heaviness. Heaviness, darkness. Yeah. I don't think I've ever experienced anything quite like it. It was... It was a pressure to be terribly afraid. There was whole days I was going through the day feeling like I could not breathe. It was the week after Passover, the week of unleavened bread, actually. 
It was very intense. And it was the time leading up to, now I think uh, Easter was celebrated during that time too. Because it was the, it was that Friday was Friday to Sunday. Yeah, so Easter Sunday would have been right in the middle of that time. Mm -hmm. So we were going through the days and it was, um, I mean, it must have been, for a lot of people, must have been difficult because it's the first time Easter Sunday had been sort of canceled. There was a great spirit of fear over everybody. If you saw people, they wouldn't look you in the eye and yeah. they would scurry into their houses. People would drive by wearing masks. And so you can't ever see anybody's face. And everybody was wearing masks out on the street, going on the bike path. Um, everywhere you looked, there were masks. So that was the week before the big protest in Lansing. So the lockdown in Michigan was supposed to end on the 15th of April. But our governor decided, pretty much unilaterally, that she was going to extend it. And she told, now the way our law works is that the, the legislature, both houses, would have had to approve her extending the lockdown. And she wanted it extended to June 1st. And the legislature said no, but they gave her emergency power until the end of April. So when our lockdown was supposed to end the middle of April, a couple days before it was supposed to end, she announced that she had had her emergency power extended, and that's when she announced she not only locked everything down, she locked it down in a way that no other state was locked down. Um, I mean, to the point of you could get pulled over if more than one person was in a car traveling somewhere. Now, I did not hear of anyone actually getting pulled over for that, but... It, that's what she announced. Nobody is to go anywhere. A friend of mine described it as, she sent us all to our rooms, and then she took away our teddy bears and our blankets, too. <laughs> yeah, that's about right. So it was leading up to the April 15th, and we knew that we wanted to participate um, with the, the lockdown. And we've never been part of anything Good luck, like... you mean? The grid the lockdown lock. was... We, yeah, were, the, we were under house arrest. We were under, under lockdown. We were told that we were not to participate. Our governor told us we were... that. Well, she couldn't stop us from protesting, but if we did, there was going to be consequences. So essentially, participating in a gridlock was sort of <laughs> totally going against what her orders were. You know, we packed the whole car, packed the whole car up full of our, our family, went down to Lansing, and got stuck in traffic. We didn't know how long we were going to get stuck in traffic for. We blew our car horn for two hours. The kids loved it. They loved it. They thought it was great. So as we were going into Lansing, and it was a really yucky day. It was, it was overcast. Snowy. It was raining and snowing. It was really nasty weather. But everybody had their car windows open, and people were playing music, and they mm -hmm. were blowing their car horns, and they were waving their signs. And it was as if... It took the first breath of air that we'd taken in weeks. It was the strangest experience Especially because last week. all of that heaviness that we had experienced for that week, kind of a despair, kind of a fear. I wouldn't say despair because we were not despairing, but no. it was as if we were watching a very terrible thing happen and the, the pressure to be afraid was quite intense. And we felt there wasn't much we can do about it. You know, that we were... There just wasn't much we can do. But my experience was going down to Lansing and being there with all these other people. Nobody had masks on. They had their windows down, music playing. People were smiling. And people were smiling. I thought people would be angry. They I were not angry. But they were not angry. They were joyous and happy. They were playing music. They were jubilant. They were jubilant. And some of the looks that I saw were the same kind of looks that were probably on our face, which was just, Wow. There are normal people. We are still here. We are still alive. Meanwhile, we were being told that every hospital in our area, we live in the middle of what's considered the biggest hotspot hot spot. in Michigan. We're right in the mm -hmm. middle of it. Now, we have friends who say that they know people who were diagnosed. We have yet to personally know anybody who has actually had the uh, infamous virus. We don't know anyone diagnosed. We don't know anyone who has died. No. That is not to say that there haven't been people. We are not disputing that. But in the middle of the hotspot, we don't personally ourselves know anyone. Right. So here we are. Um, suddenly, you know, the experience going out from the, the, the gridlock when we came back, the very next day, do you remember what I said? I said, the spell is over. 
the spell was broken. It felt like there was an actual spell that was actually over people, and it was just snap, like that, broken. April 15th. By the 16th, we started seeing people driving around in their cars again. We people saw started taking the masks lawn off. Lawn companies began working, whether yeah. they were supposed to or not. The, the was that the day I gave the guy a the... A couple days later was when the guy showed up to yeah. cut the ladies. We have a single mother who lives next door, and um, there's a man who normally takes care of her yard, and he showed up to cut the grass. Now, it may be snowing, but our grass is growing like, <laughs> like a weed. We, I was so happy to hear those lawnmowers going. I just... <laughs> you went out and brought him a cold drink. I did. <laughs> I did. I, I, he, thought that, he thought that I was going to approach him and chew him out, and he didn't want to make eye contact, but when I told him thank you, he, um, he perked right up, especially when I handed him beer. <laughs> we, were, we were told you couldn't go fishing. We were told you can't cut your grass. We were told you cannot go anywhere that you might have to use gas for your car. If you have to go to the grocery store, you can only buy what, what we consider essentials, and that does not include seeds, by the way. No, oh, yeah, no seeds, seeds. No, nothing to make your lawn nice, no flowers. We don't want you going to the store to get non-essential things like that, so we're going to make them off limits. No car seats, no furniture, no carpet, no flooring. I, I Both remember. sections of our grocery stores were roped off. Yeah, when I saw, when I saw the sections roped off at the, at the Lowe's and Home Depot and things, that just, that got me. It was quite amazing so after april 15th oh everything changed people began doing something called nullification mm -hmm. which is where the government tells you to do something and you look at them and you say noted <laughs> now it was after april 15th that we celebrated because that was the end of unleavened bread we mm -hmm. celebrated by um frequenting one of the restaurants we didn't actually go into the restaurant we did take out we got a big meal from them. And we had an opportunity, I had an opportunity to talk to the store owner for a little bit. And I was encouraging her. I was saying, listen, it's after April 15th. It's, it's done. It's like, well, no, it's been extended. It's like, no, the, the whole thing is done. So for the next couple of weeks, going from the 15th to the end of the month, that's when the, the extension was going to run out because she extended the lockdown order all the way down to... Our governor was pretty furious. Yeah, she was mad. She tried blaming the people who participated. She in said the that there was going to be a great spike of cases because there were some people who'd gotten out and walked around on the lawn of the Capitol. Oh, and handing candy she out to children there was without handing candy without gloves on. Well, first of all, in that first protest, we didn't really see any other children, <laughs> and let alone anyone handing out candy. But I, I get we weren't on the Capitol lawn. I don't know what was going on over there. But um, she was angry, and she said, well, they just defeated their own purpose because now the lockdown's going to last longer because we're going to have the spike in cases. <laughs> now, that day, there was 840 new cases reported in Michigan. There was 860 cases reported the next day. By two weeks later, the number of cases being reported every day had dropped to 134 <laughs> cases a day. <laughs> now... Today, supposedly 334 new cases showed up, but the problem now is that our governor is using phantom data. Yes, the she legislature is. has repeatedly requested where she's getting her data from, and her administration is releasing numbers that cannot be backed up by any data. You cannot find the foundation for the data she's releasing. So we really don't have any idea what's going on. We know that whole hospitals that were supposed to be dealing with, with you know, with specifically virus-related patients have been closed down. They are not only empty, but the entire staff has been sent home. There's nobody there. So one of the big shockers uh, in this whole story is, well, first, uh, the president of the United States basically said, we're going to be opening up in time for Easter. That's important. But then he extended it all the way through to the end of April. April. So he said basically May 1st is going to be when everything opens up. So... Uh, our governor kind of followed suit. She went to the 15th, but then she extended it to the end of the month. But then before we got to the, tw the end of the month, she extended it again. This time she extended it to May 15th, and the legislature said, oh no, we aren't extending it. Mm -mm. They voted it down, and they also voted to limit her power. So what she did to get out of this, because she now has no legal ability to extend her, her order any longer, she canceled her old order and she started a new one. 
So now she has her 28 day clock started back from the beginning and she can conceivably keep doing this till kingdom come. I mean, she can do this forever. So she issued an executive order starting on May 1st, going on until May 28th. And she has a whole new set of rules of things that you can and cannot do. And there's some things that she lightened up and some things that she clamped down. So now that our, we're getting better and our cases are dropping by the day, now we suddenly have to wear mandatory masks. If mm -hmm. you're out in a public place indoors, you must wear a mask, and according as, to her. And as we get closer and closer to the 28th, we're going to see another executive order, probably canceling the previous one and starting a new 28-day mm -hmm. clock. Today, our restaurant, the Michigan Association, I believe, there's an association of restaurants and hotel owners. They sent a letter to the governor stating they will be opening May 29th. And if she extends this lockdown order, it is going to be, to all intents and purposes, the end of a considerable portion of the hospitality industry in the state of Michigan. That's it, awful. it cannot continue any So they're going to open no matter what, basically. So we knew that April 15th was an important event to... Um, to participate in, but we also knew that there was a very good chance that she was going to extend it past the um, 30th of April. And it just so happens on the 30th was another protest that we had the pleasure of participating in again. Packed up the, the children, went back down to Lansing again, got stuck in gridlock, not quite as big of a gridlock. Well, the, the trouble was the second time people tried to recreate gridlock by just leaving their cars <laughs> in the road. and that We also got there late compared yeah. to... Well, yeah, we had trouble getting there that So day. the whole thing was supposed to start at 9 o'clock, but kind of hard to mobilize our whole family and get there, you know, at 9 o'clock in the morning. So we didn't get there until more like noon. By then, the whole thing was kind of... The whole shindig was going A down. A lot of people had gone inside the Capitol at that point. We, we didn't get out of the car. Our family was very uneasy with us being there, both sides of our family. So You know, we got to um, honk our horns and be there in supporting the people. Wave lots of flags. We waved the flags, and but we were there. And again, this is a learning experience both from us, for us and for our children. Now, the point was made to us that protesting for someone who has illegally seized power doesn't really do any good, but we no. were actually not there making a fuss for the governor because the governor is a lost cause. Right. It's the legislature mm -hmm. to remind them that we expect them to do something. However, at this point, it's become clear that they really can't do a lot either. They've brought a lawsuit against her. It didn't take months. By that time, half the industry in our, our state is getting... I mean, she's gradually permitting construction to begin and permitting this to begin. But the problem is, what happens in September mm -hmm. if there's another wave of cases? I mean, we have a governor now who, at her whim, will shut down anything she feels like shutting down. But I think that it's people are going to be a lot more prepared and a lot, <laughs> a lot more prepared to not take her seriously. There's always going to be people taking her seriously, but I think there's going to be a lot more business owners that are not going to be quick to shut down. And it's going to be near impossible to enforce a shutdown, an economic shutdown again. The only reason an economic shutdown happened the first time is it was done voluntarily. People believed that it needed to be done. Yep. But you know what? Most of the people who shut down their businesses and are now having trouble getting them started up again legally according to the order they're not going to be quick to shut down their business again. Well, we've learned something. It's what you learn with every government. The government serves with, in our country, is supposed to serve at, at the will of and with the consent of the governed. And if our legislature isn't going to do anything about it, and our governor is going to just seize whatever power she feels like taking over us, then it's up to us to say, well, we the people do not consent. Right. And one of the things that we've been noticing lately with the mask law, uh, it's not a law, the mask order, a lot of the grocery stores, a lot of the places that are open uh, basically have signs posted everywhere saying you must wear a mask, but they leave the loopholes open for people who uh, maybe have asthma or some kind of medical condition. Um, Lauren and I have been going to the grocery store uh, without a mask intentionally. Um, we're not trying to get anyone sick. We're not trying to get sick ourselves. But if you don't have to wear a mask, I don't think we should. 
There are some pretty deep philosophical reasons for this, though. There are. And it goes deeper than just a mask or no mask. It, it goes back to the idea that we are seeing an attempt to control us through fear. And we have reason to believe that the order to wear a mask in the store is to cause people to comply with an order that under normal circumstances would not be tolerated. Also, it is a visual thing to show compliance. Uh, when you look around and see everyone wearing masks and you're not wearing a mask, it's unsettling. Being different is unsettling. It is. And you really stick out like a sore thumb. But sometimes it's okay to stick out like a sore thumb. You know, part of th there's an instinct to sort of want to hide in conformity, but you can't always do that. There actually is some basis to why we don't think that it would really be very it, it's it's almost pointless to wear a mask. It's I know not we practical. have some friends we have some friends who say, well, a little bit is absolutely better than nothing. But no, it's not. Because here's the thing. If you get if you get used to standing in line and doing everything that's required of you, whether it really makes sense to do or not, because it's required of you, you will eventually march yourself into a gas chamber. We've seen it happen before. So if you do not get used to the idea of this is being done for political reasons to cause great fear among people, and that is what we believe actually the whole ordering of mask is actually being done. It's, doing, it's being done to create a continued feeling of fear. If you don't resist that fear, then you will in the future do things very harmful to yourself and your family in the spirit of just resisting the fear. And it, it comes down to we're fighting a battle or fighting a battle that's not against people. And this is not a man's conspiracy. This is a battle between spirits that you can't see and that's why there's such a spiritual element to this there's a spirit of fear that is attempting to separate families from each other it's turning neighbors against neighbors it's turning things that should be bright and cheery and open and full of joy it's darkening them and trying to destroy them this spirit of fear being done in the name of an illness right. but the spirit of fear has been tried to be spread before last year we saw it with the measles epidemic it and was tried to be spread then and I have a feeling that whatever the next big fear is going to be it won't even be medical but do you remember how last year the big measles thing mm -hmm. it was intentionally sown that the Orthodox Jews in in um, New York were responsible for outbreaks yeah. of measles. They were going and the after them. Orthodox community here in Oak Park was going to be responsible mm -hmm. for outbreaks of measles. And in this particular outbreak, suddenly churches are the right. focus. Churches are going to spread it. Everybody can go to Walmart and they'll be safe, but if a church dares to get together, that's bad. That's really irresponsible. You are going to cause the deaths of people. So there is a spiritual war going on here, the likes of which we perhaps have never witnessed. And the whole wearing of masks is a public sign of the, of the compliance with this idea, the compliance with this system. It is not for, I do not believe it is for safety. No, it's not for safety. It's for, it's a, it is a mark. It is a mark. It's a mark. It's a mark of compliance. And that's why right now they know that they can't make it a law that you wear a mask all the time. They know that all they can do is order you. But even when they order you, they have to leave all sorts of loopholes open. They as in people who are supporting this continuation right. of a spirit of fear and oppression on us. Exactly. So it's still a choice at this point. They want to see if you're going to offer willing submission to their plan. <laughs> Speaking of fear. Daniel's having a bad dream. Yeah. Well, I think we talked about most of what we wanted to talk about. Well, we were talking about how we were looking at this as a spiritual war and the antidote to fear help Daniel. is a recognition that God is in control. God is in control of this whole thing. 
He's in control of when we live and when we die. He is sovereign. He is in control of this whole thing. And in the past, in history, plagues are visited on people for a reason. They are to cause repentance. They are to separate those who believe from those who don't. If you look at the plagues of Egypt, it was to teach the Egyptians and the Israelites who God was. It was to show God's power. And God hasn't changed. And this particular plague is affecting the entire world. It's affecting people in ways that we've never seen anything affect an entire world's population at the same time. So it's hard not to look at this and see it as something of a biblical or something of a, of a, of a spiritual thing as much as a physical thing. So because it is obviously a plague, because it is unprecedented what we're seeing happen, because of the spiritual element involved, we're recognizing that we have to approach this as a matter of faith. Who are we trusting to be in charge of our life? Who are we trusting to keep us safe? Are we giving over our faith and our trust to the experts who are telling us how to live and how you need to do this and how you do this and waiting for them to come up with a cure that will save us and waiting for them to give us the instructions for how we must protect our families and maybe they'll come up with an injection that will save us by you know preventing any of this to ever happen again it's really answering the question of who is your savior who is our savior and who is in charge of this and what a test this is for what's in the hearts of all the people. This is a test of faith. How are we going to react? And it's a practice run. It is. Because we are told that there is something bad coming. It's either in our lifetime or in the future. But before Messiah comes back, there's going to be some bad things happen. Boy, it feels like it's this generation though, doesn't it? And if we can't stand up to this. Oh, I know. Because basically... We're still being fed. We're still warm and comfortable. We're in our house. Mm -hmm. Our family is together. We're not separated. We're not in jail. We're not being fed to lions. Terrible things are not happening to us. We can still us. buy toilet paper. If we cannot keep our heads about us and resist the fear being pushed on us, if we cannot remember that God is in control and he is sovereign and he is protecting us, if we can't do those things and we don't have any hope of standing in the future, this is practice. And it's crucial. If there's going to be a mark that's going to be put on us, that's going to prevent us from buying and selling, that is going to be terrifying. And the pressure to get it is going to be immense. If we can't resist the pressure to conform now, we will not be able to resist a mark in the future. I remember learning about that and reading Revelation for about for the first time in sometime 2009, 2008, 2009, something like that. And I was convinced it was just a few years off. But then a few years come and a few years go and it's like, well, no, doesn't seem like that's happening. And then, um, but I never would have thought, you know, as the years go by, it's like, it seems like it's getting farther and farther away. You know, maybe this is something way off in the distant future. But then this happens. Things change in a few seconds. And things change so quickly. It's like in hours, everything changes. And that's that explains a lot. And we can all see now. We can see it as clear as the nose on your face. Something's coming. Something's not only coming, but you can see how they... Th how people in charge of governments around the world can conspire together right now to say... Unless you show us proof that you are immune to coronavirus, the great dreaded word, you may not be able to buy or sell. And maybe it's not this thing. Maybe it's something else. But we've seen it. We've seen how easily it can happen. But the fact that all the nations of the world are on the same page, when are all the nations of the world ever on the same page with anything? The entire world has sold out of toilet paper. <laughs> it's just crazy. But that's why, that is why we have been not wearing masks. Because, for one thing, we do not believe that it's really going to protect anybody to wear them. Not ourselves or other people. And the other reason is, if we cannot resist the pressure to conform with this thing, how will we ever face something that we're told 
you can't buy or sell unless you wear this mark on your body. So this is a test. This is a test. It's a soft mark. It's a soft mark. It's an opportunity to make a decision and to maintain your own sovereignty to a certain extent. And by the way, we have very faithful, God-believing friends who disagree with us extremely fervently on, on this and have let us know. And that is quite difficult for us also because this is not something we really want to sit around and argue with them on, nor do we want to look at someone else who has decided to wear a mask and say, oh yeah, well, you're just succumbing to wearing the mark on your face. No. It's not how we're thinking about it. And I don't want anyone to mistake it. No. And if... if this is for us. Right. For, for, for me and Ben. What, how are we going to handle this? How do we stand up and not be fearful and yield ourselves to God and say, God, you are in charge. You are our Savior. You are keeping us safe. And if we really are not of this world, right? then we should be okay with not conforming to the pattern of this world. And if the pattern of this world right now is everybody wears a mask just for the sake of wearing a mask, because it's already been proven that that's not really effective, then we're not of this world. We're not just rebels. We're not just doing it because everyone else is doing it, so we ought not do it. There's plenty of good things that everyone's doing that we do too. But when it comes to this, in particular, we do not conform to the pattern of the world in particular. And we are doing it for the, for the safety of our family, for the integrity of our faith, and hopefully we are being wise and not foolish. <laughs> <laughs> right, we're seeking the will of God we're not just seeking after our own will. We don't want to do it, so we're not going to do it. And it may look that way to some people. I know some people in our family right now think we are being extreme and we're being rebels and we're just rebelling for the sake of rebelling and no. various other things. And also... We're not lawless people. I think, well, Ben was saying that he felt quite angry at the level of lying that we're seeing happening. Oh, yeah. Like being told that there's a certain number of people sick and dying. And then we come to find out, well, those numbers are all being changed so that something looks worse than it is. It's bad it's, enough as it is, but it's made to look worse so that you will be afraid. It's the empty hospitals. So there's, a, there's a, just a multi-pronged attack going on here. Yeah. Well, I, I'm pretty much exhausted. How about you? <laughs> I'm exhausted just hearing it all spoken out. <laughs> it's a very intense emotional thing. It is. And you and I have been talking about it a lot over these past couple weeks, this whole month. It comes down to this. Everything that can be shaken will be shaken. Yep. And we're told to be strong and courageous. So we're doing our best. Doing our best. Not a spirit of fear, but of a sound mind, right? Yes. <laughs> so I think... As you can see, now we're tired out. Yes. So I think with that, <laughs> <laughs> I think that concludes our Ben and Lauren show. If you're still with us, I hopefully you still are. And we'd love to hear your comments. If you have any thoughts, if you watch this whole thing to the end, we'd like to hear what you think. If you want to argue with us and tell us we're crazy. That's fine, too. We can take it. <laughs> so I think with that, we're going to say good night. Say good night, Lauren. Good night, Lauren. Good night, everyone. <laughs>